Greetings again in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Pastor Major Hilbert Sr. coming to you from On The Wall Ministries uh, here in Alta Vista, Virginia. We're coming to you this morning at our Sunday School Hour. We thank God for you joining us uh, at our ministry here on our Friday Night Bible Institute classes, but also on our Sunday morning Sunday School Hour. We do thank God for each of you that are joining us on Facebook Live, and we uh, hope that, uh, that we be uh, doing something that would be edifying to you this morning to be able to get you a better understanding of God's Word. So uh, we got a beautiful lesson this morning, our uh, lesson two out of our summer uh, quarter uh, coming from uh, uh, the uh, Standard Commentary. We're coming to you out of uh, our uh, June 12th lesson two, uh, King James Version, God foretells redemption. We talked about God foretells condemnation next week. Uh, last week, and we know that the Word of God says that uh, uh, weeping may endure for the night, said, but joy cometh in the morning. So uh, even though hard times may happen in the past and God's uh, uh, condemnation upon us, he says that his mercies are new every day. So we can be thankful that God's mercies is new each and every day. So even though he foretells condemnation, God is a redemptive God. He has a time uh, and an opportunity for us to be redeemed from our sins. Uh, as we talk on Friday night, uh, we, we have to understand is the power of the cross brings redemption to the world. It brings salvation into the world. So as we look at our text this morning, Old Testament uh, a text of uh, Isaiah, we'll study it again from last week, uh, for the ninth chapter of Isaiah. Verses 1 through 13, as we're going to study this morning, uh, our text this morning uh, says, and uh, uh, hopefully as we look at our text this morning, we're talking about partners in a new creation. Uh, this unit study is talking about God delivers and he restores. Uh, out of our lesson today, our lesson names hopefully be able to identify who the servant God is talking about this morning, then describe the function in text as part of Isaiah's servant song, and then identify one way that we can be a better servant of the servant. God uh, sent his darling son Jesus into the world to serve and, and to seek, save, and serve mankind. So it's your and my opportunity and duty to be able to also serve. We are called to be a better servant to the ultimate servant. So this morning, let us look at our lesson, Isaiah for the ninth chapter, verses 1 through 13, our scripture reads, Listen, O isles, unto me, hearken unto ye people from far. The Lord hath called me from the womb, and from the bowels of my mother uh, hath he made mention of my name. Verse 2, And he hath made my mouth like a soft sword. In the shadow of his hand hath he hid me, and made me a polished shaft. In the quiver hath he hid me. Verse 3, and he said unto me, Thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Verse 4, Then I said, I have labored in vain, and I have spent my strength for naught, and in vain, yet my judgment is with the Lord, and my work is with God, my God. Verse 5, And now saith the Lord, that formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob again unto him, though Israel be not gathered, uh, yet shall I be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. Verse 6, and he said, is the light thing that I should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and restore the reserve, preserved of, uh, of Israel. And I will give thee a light unto the Gentiles, that thy mayest be my salvation unto the ends of the earth. And verse 7, Thus saith the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, and, and his Holy One, to him whom man despises, to him the nation abhorreth, to the servant of the rulers, kings shall see and arise, and princes shall also worship, because of the Lord Thou is faithful in the Holy One of Israel. He has chose thee. Verse 8. Thus saith the Lord, In an acceptable time I have heard thee, in the day of salvation have I helped thee. I will preserve thee and give thee a covenant of the people to establish the earth and to cause the inherit the desolate heritages. Verse 9. That thou mayest 
say to the prisoners, go forth, and to them that are in darkness, show yourselves, and ye shall feed in the ways, and their pastures shall be in high places. Verse 10, uh, they shall not hunger nor thirst, neither shall the heat nor sun smite them. For he that has mercy on them shall lead them, and even by the springs of the water shall guide them. Verse 11, and I will make all of my mountains away, and my highways shall be exalted. Verse 12, behold, these shall come from far and low, from the north and from the west, for these from the land of Shinon. Verse 13. 13, this is our end of our text this morning. Sing, O heavens, and be joyful, O earth, and break forth in singing, O mountains, and the Lord has comforted his people and will have mercy upon the afflicted. This morning, our key text is that eighth verse of Isaiah 49, says that, Thus saith the Lord, in an acceptable time I have heard thee, in the day of salvation have I helped thee, and I will preserve thee, and give thee a covenant unto the people to establish the earth, and to cause thee uh, uh, to inherit the desolate uh, heritages. So again, as we look at our text, we want to look at, identify this servant in our text, also uh, describe the function of this servant song, and identify ways that we can be a better servant to the servant. So let's get into our introduction this morning the right time. It says young people are constantly and all impatiently waiting for the right time, uh, which they feel sometimes will never come. They want to be eager in their anticipation of the day that uh, they will get the learner's permit or having a driver's license or even their first car. And the taste of freedom may come with this new responsibility uh, as a new driver beginning to work and paying his own insurance or, or looking toward his graduation that is coming uh, sooner or later. And, and then, and all young people desire to have some independence and freedom as adults, uh, but although whether they will want uh, when uh, they are received or responsibility, that's another thing. You might want to have the responsibility, but when you get the responsibility, that's another matter. Israel was also waiting, what, impatiently, waiting on God to act. And while their freedom uh, in him would uh, certainly come with some responsibilities, that day uh, would also be one of great joy. All this would be accomplished to one servant eager to do God's will, and that is the one and only Jesus the Christ. So as we look at our text this morning, uh, in our context, uh, Isaiah is four poems of the Messiah. Uh, uh, is Isaiah 42, 49, ver uh, uh, chapter 50, and uh, 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 verses uh, chapter 52. Uh, they are called servant songs or servant poems, and then sometimes they're added uh, 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 because of the fact that even though the word servant is not used in certain of our texts today, that is implied to us that these are uh, calls for each one of us to become a servant of the Lord. And its prophecy is really not about Isaiah, but it's about the coming prophecy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And this servant song begins and ends with an appeal not only to Israel, but to you and I, to all of the nations of the world. The last three verses of 48 exhort the people to flee from Babylon, uh, have the assurance that God has given them, will take care of them in spite of what they're going through. See, we got to understand that in spite of what God has us in, he will bring us through it if we would only put our trust in him. Then as we get into our lesson discussion this morning, uh, we're looking at identify the servant called by God. Uh, verse 1 of that 49th chapter of Isaiah says, Listen, O owls, unto me, and hearken unto me, ye people, from afar. For the Lord has called me from the womb, and from the bowels of my mother has he made mention of my name. He's telling, uh, listen, O owls. That means uh, the people of Israel, but not only that, the people of the world, he said, listen, 
Listen, the lend attentive ear. When God is trying to speak to us, we not only need to listen, but he said you need to hearken. Hearken means that you be obedient to the word, ye people, even those from afar. God has a message for us if we would only listen to his word. He said that he has called me. Even from my mother's womb and from the mouth, her mother, uh, has he mentioned my name. See, uh, 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 what could give a person more confidence in, 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 in calling than that, that the Lord called him, but he also knew his name. He called him. God had a plan for you and I. He had a plan for Isaiah. God's plan for our life is not haphazard, is not a splat. A slapdash is not being made up of, of our humanity progresses without an end to God's mind. God knows where we're going. He knows his intentions for us and the servants that he had called even before we were formed in our mother's womb. Shakespeare asked the question, what's in the name? Hmm? In case of this servant, quite a lot. There's a whole lot in the name. More importantly than revealing the name itself, the fact that God made mention of it. Ain't it good to know that God calls out your name every now and then? He'll call out your name. It's not, uh, uh, we've all experienced greeting someone uh, who has clearly forgotten our name. It's not unforgivable error to forget somebody's name, but God knows each and every one of our names and he cares for each one of us personally and intimately in ways that are not possible uh, to, for unknown uh, to, to uh, not possible for us to understand how much God loves us and how many times that he comes to see about us and he knows our each and every situation isn't that good to know this morning verse 2 says that and he made my mouth like a soft sword, and in the shadow of his hand has he hid me, and made me a polished shaft in the quiver as he hid me. He said that, that, that and he has made my mouth a, a sharp sword. Uh, this word sharp sword in the prophet's mouth likely refers to the words of God. He called the servant to speak prophetically. He, he, he gives the servant words of authority to be able to speak. And although Jesus' words bring peace when we accept them, but there is also a way of dividing the righteous from the unrighteous. When the word of God, he said, it cuts like a what? Two-edged sword that goes coming and going. He says that in the shadow of my hand have you hid me. And you made me a polished shaft in the quiver thou hast hid me. The shadow of God, whether it's his hands or his wings, is a way to speak of the safety that we have when we are in God's care. In this polished shaft, it meant that the, it kept the servant's shape. He kept them honed and ready to go into battle. See, if your shaft is rusty, your sword is rusty, that means you have not been doing the work that God has called you to do. But when you utilize a tool or weapon, it's a polished shaft ready for battle. In conjunction with the image of the sword, it implies that judgment to those who do not accept the word of God. So he has his sword in his hand, ready for judgment and ready to, to redeem us if necessary. Verse 3, it says unto me, He said unto me, that thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I'll be glorified. The names of the speaker, he called him his servant. And a few actions can be given of why Israel is named. And one view is that Jesus has become the true Israel. Israel, man, he said, thou art my servant, O Jesus, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. God is going to send his darling son, Jesus, in the world that, that all the people of the earth, every nation, will be glorified because of the great work that God has done through his darling son, Jesus Christ. He says that, and because the church is Christ's body, that empowered by the spirit that God has given to us, ultimately the servant really is Jesus, who is the head of the church. So we are coming as the servant of God, the church, uh, 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 empowered by Jesus Christ, 
uh, empowered by the power of the Holy Spirit, now we are to be able to go out and to do this work that God has called us to do. We are servant of God. The church has become their servant uh, by the example that Jesus Christ set. Verse 4, and then I said, I have labored in vain, and I have spent my strength for naught and in vain. Yet surely my judgment is with the Lord, and my work is with God. See, is there more, any more discouraging feeling than when you look at one's work and feel like that you've been laboring in vain? But because God's definition of success is not a conventionally or earthly definition, when God uh, sees us, it's not in the way that we define things. God defines things differently. He looks at faithful servants uh, can sometimes be discouraged because we're looking at things thinking not we have not succeeded. So the prophet Jeremiah proclaimed what God wanted him to say, but many times he, he even proclaimed it, but he was not successful. The people did not repent, and they ended up in captivity. So uh, even when God uh, tells you to go out and do something, don't uh, consider that it wasn't successful based on the way you see it, because God's success is not based in on the same way that we define success. So let's not be discouraged. Let's not be discouraged because, see, uh, that my work with God is never in vain. Nothing that you do for God is wasted. Everything that you do for God has a purpose behind it, and, and it'll come to its appointed end if we be faithful. Verse 5, And now, Says the Lord that has formed me from the womb as a servant to bring Jacob again to him. And though Israel be not gathered, yet I shall be glorified in the eyes of the Lord and my strength. My God shall be my strength. He went from not having any strength in verse 4. His work was in vain. He was feeling discouraged. But now all of a sudden he's getting encouraged. He said that the Lord formed him from his mother's womb to be a servant. To be able to bring Jacob, to bring Israel back. To bring us back to the God, our duty is to be able to bring the people of the world back to God, not just Israel, but all nations. He said that thou, though Israel be not gathered, yet I'm glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my strength shall be, uh, uh, and, and my God shall be my strength. See, just because what you're doing don't come uh, out to be the way you expect it to be, don't, don't consider that you have failed, because as long as you are doing the work for the Lord, uh, nothing is wasted. He said that if one soul come to the Lord, uh, heaven's rejoices. So don't, don't think that just because we are we're, we're not getting the best results out of what the work that God has assigned us to do, it's not for us to measure anyway. It's not for us to be obedient to the word. Let's do what God called us to do and, 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 and wait on God's time because God's time is always perfect. And here God is called the Jacob and Israel. It, it talks about interchangeable, talking about the nation of Israel, and it, it refers to all the Jewish people when he talks about Judah and Israel and the northern and the southern kingdom. But at this time, the servant could only anticipate gathering Israel together. Its redemption would glorify God's name. When God takes an individual whose life has been falling apart and he turns that individual around, it's good to know that God is glorified because he, he says when he uh, saves one of all souls that heaven will rejoice and we should be excited also and not be discouraged when we're going out doing the work trying to measure success based on our definition and the Lord's plan. Isn't it good to know that God has a plan for your life? Careful all, verse 6, and he said, it's a light thing that thou shouldest be a servant to raise up the tribes of Israel and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will give thee a light to the Gentiles and that thou mayest be salvation unto the earth. So here he's saying, uh, it's a light thing. And here uh, the servant of God is looking at this challenge of trying to get the people of Israel to hearken unto the word of the Lord. And, and here God is coming to Isaiah and telling him, uh, it's a light thing. And, 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 and realizing it's not a light thing, he said, but that thou shouldest be a servant to raise up the tribe of Jacob and to restore Israel. You know, here he's saying that, that, that it's not the, 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 the biggest thing you can do, but it's an important thing. 
See, everything that we do for God is not at a level of excellence. Everything that we do, but in it, look, he said that every idle word you got to give an account of. Anyone who gives a, a, a drink of water to one of the least of my little ones, he said that, that you, you'll be remembered for that. So the thing about it, he says it's a light thing. It's not that big a deal. He says that, but you need to understand that, that it's a light thing. It would be a light thing. People were struggling with faithfulness throughout their, their days in Egypt, in their wilderness, and they, in the promised land. And indeed, though Israel had been uh, uh, in a united nation at the time, idolatry contributed to them fracturing into the, uh, uh, the divided nation that they, they became. And the way God speaks to this servant suggests that not only Judah will be restored, but God will restore every tribe of the earth. All of the tribes, the northern and the southern kingdom, the ten would be lost to Assyria and the other to the Samarians. But the thing about it is that was a huge task, easy only for the Lord to accomplish. It's an easy thing for God, but it's a hard thing for you and I. That's what we got to realize. God will not give us a task that he cannot accomplish. It may be a, a hard thing or easy thing for us, but it's not a Hard, an easy thing for God. It's not a light thing for God. It, it, it's something that God has done that he can do and he did what only he could do. Jesus Christ did only what he could do. We couldn't go to the cross and die to redeem man. Only Jesus could do that. But it became a light unto the Gentiles that they may know that salvation is available to them also. So here, the prophet is telling them, not only will you reveal the, 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 the light unto the, the, to the Jewish nations, the southern and the northern tribes, your, the world will be enlightened because of this, this servant that will come to become that light unto the world. Verse 7, thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, the Holy One, to him whom man despises, to him the nation that whores, uh, to a servant of rulers, kings shall see and arise, princes shall also worship, because the Lord that is faithful in the Holy One of Israel, he shall choose thee. You know, what the Lord does is flows from his character and his, we talked about it on Friday night, uh, it's the character of God, the attributes of God. His character is to do right. God is going to do right. His title is attributed to as a result of his actions. God, the redeemer of Israel, acted to free people from sin and from slavery. God chose Israel to be his special people, whether they acted holy or not. God remained the Holy One. And God's title will emphasize his power, his majesty, his fidelity to keep his promises and his claim that he is holy. This is the Lord who addressed one whom man despises and a nation at horse being rejected by so many. I wonder if God also rejected him. He was wondering, if God rejected all of them, why has not he rejected me? But he says that kings shall see and arise and princes shall also worship because the Lord that is faithful, Holy One of Israel, he shall choose thee effectively. The rejection of man and nation is dismissed. Both kings and princes shall heed to the servant's word. And, and with the success in ministry, not based on charisma or magnetism or leadership quality, but, 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 of the, but success is not a, a result of, of us doing everything according to uh, our own personal accomplishment. It's whether or not the Lord is faithful. God is faithful. And if you be obedient to the word of God, that faithfulness operates through you. God's faithfulness will be in your life if you walk in obedience to his word. Hey, go. If I have to go all by myself, isn't that what the psalmist here? You do the work for the God that said, we depend on his faithfulness and we can worship the God because of who he is. Then the day of salvation, verse 8. Uh, Thus says the Lord, in the sepulchre time that I heard thee, in the day of salvation I have helped thee. I will preserve thee and give thee a covenant of the people and to establish uh, the earth and to cause uh, the inherent to uh, desolate heritage, to cause to inherit the desolate 
heritage. Here he says that uh, the acceptable time is uh, and, and, and the day of salvation. These are parallelisms that we have learned about earlier. Both denote the time that God will hear his people and act again on their behalf. In the short term, this would have been uh, the people's return of Babylon or whatever. But we're talking about now prophetically. God is going to have a day that it becomes that acceptable time that we need to accept uh, Jesus Christ is our Lord. The promise is primarily to the servant, but it extends beyond even to the covenant people of God. Though we might expect uh, this would be a promise made with Israel, uh, it shows that he said this promise is made to all people, even those desolate places that, that did not know God. The promise recalls the land of distribution by Joshua after Israel had been completed, uh, their land distribution. Judah left Berate after the exiles went to Babylon, but all the land would be reassigned and renewed. See, everything that the devil stole from you, God will restore if you are faithful. He says then in verse 9a, it says that, that thou mayest say to the prisoners, go forth, and to them that are in darkness, show yourself, and they shall feed in their ways, and in their pastors shall be uh, all high places. He says that in the verse that the concept directly relates to God's role as the redeemer. He says that the imagery uh, continues that the idea that those that are oppressed, that are in darkness, uh, uh, that they, they, they may shed their fear because God is going to rescue them. He said that he's going to feed them along the way. Along the way, along the roadside where things don't usually grow, that he's going to feed them along the way. And then he says, you're going to pastor you in high places. Those high places is where, where, where high places are, where, 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 where not too many uh, coal and ice and snow is up on the mountaintop. And then in the valley, uh, ground is not, uh, uh, is not good for agricultural. But he said that I'm going to feed you on the low ground. And I'm going to feed you on the high mountain. I'm going to feed you ever, wherever uh, you go. God is going to prosper you. He's going to prosper you in ways that doesn't seem to be acceptable to anyone else. He said that he's going to bless them. Herds coming home. Uh, the, the shepherd's going to be having flowing waters and greener pastures because of the fact that we are operating in the obedience of God. The entire creation in God's hands will be blessed. Because of his servant that he sent into the world, Jesus. He sent Jesus into the world to die for our sins. And that became the redeeming principle that will be able to help us out. So he said that he will bless us. And we will become a blessing to the world. Verse 10 says that they shall not hunger nor thirst. Neither shall the heat in the sun smite them. And he shall have mercy on them. And shall lead them, even by the springs of water, shall he guide them. So here he is saying is that he he's saying that he's going to feed them by the way, and they'll never thirst nor hunger, neither shall heat shall smite them, and he'll have mercy on them. And even the springs of water shall guide them. He fulfilled the verses literally and figuratively. Jesus did this. And his encounter with the Samaritan woman that he met at the well, his power over spiritual thirst, his power over spiritual hunger. He says, I am the bread of life. I am the water in dry places. He became the living water and the bread that will survive us to alleviate the hunger that we would have in this world. There will be no more hunger. There will be no more thirst. He says, the sun, I like that old song, the sun shall smite thee by day and the moon by night. So here he's saying is that God will smite the sun to not to be able to bring heat down on us. He'll take away the thirst. He'll take away the hunger that he'll be have mercy on us if we would only call upon his name. Verse 9. Verse 9 says that, that they may say to prisoners, go forth and to them that are in darkness, show yourself and they shall feed you in ways. Excuse me. I, I jumped to verse. Excuse me. Verse 11. I apologize. Verse 11. 
I hit the page and the page jumped back on me. And I will make all of my mountains away and my highway shall be exalted. A traveler approaching the mountain in ancient times, he had three options. You had an option to go over the mountain or you could go around the mountain or you could turn around and go back. Things can become discouraging when you're doing the work of the Lord. He said going over a, a, a mountain might be the direct way, but there's all kinds of dangers when you try to go over a mountain. When the servant is led by the people, even mountains, there would be a safe way to get across to your destination. The highways were more like desert roads. They're, they're made uh, and to be raised up so that will not be treacherous in the time. And then he said, verse 12, Behold, these shall come from far, and lo, these from the north and from the west, and these from the lands of Shinon. He says, two directions are given, pointing uh, from the pilgrims who would make their journey from afar. And they could imply their return of these ten tribes of Israel and Assyria and the Gentiles, and even the exiles of Babylon will return from the east. The land of Shinon could refer to the country even further west or east of Babylon, but likely it refers to land near the southern border of Egypt. It suggested that a copy of Isaiah found in the Dead Sea Scrolls said that, that the implicit citation and implication, all directions are covered. People will come from everywhere to get to know the Lord. Hey, from the east and the west, the north and the south, they'll be coming from everywhere just because of what God did through Jesus Christ made salvation available to everybody. Part C in our study, Call to Joy. Call to Joy. He says, Sing, O heavens, be joyful, O earth, and break forth into singing, O mountains, for the Lord has comforted his people and will have mercy upon the afflicted. Here he said, sing and be joyful and break forth uh, into singing. These are parallel terms. Again, the repetition once emphasizes that that joyful song is the correct impulse following the blessings that God do for you. When God does something for us, it should uh, uh, excite joy in our heart. In, in, in Hebrew thinking, the sky contains several layers of heavens, and the heavens rested on the mountains, and ceilings were su supported by these pillars, and the earth is set beneath. Isaiah called all creation to enter into praise for the Lord, announces his intentions to comfort his people and have mercy upon the afflicted. Paul picks up this theme in Romans 8. He said, declaring that creation still suffers until God's people are revealed. Heaven and earth won't be the same until Jesus the Christ come back to redeem his people and to finish the work that God has assigned him to do. Hmm? God, it's time for us to be thankful and joyful for what he has already done in our life. And I like the old song says, he don't do nothing else, he's done enough, ain't he? He's did enough by Jesus Christ coming into the world to be able to redeem us from our sin. God foretells redemption. As we come to our close this morning, speak and sing. At the right time, God sent Jesus to the earth to be able to offer salvation to all that will accept him as Lord and Savior. This call is to those who are in our families, in our communities, and also those in far distant lands that, that we will never visit, may not even never know. But our responsibility in this time uh, is, 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 is twofold. It, it, it's to proclaim the good news and to worship God with all creation. And we are comforted and we are experienced the mercy of God each and every day. Therefore, sing to God. Give God all praise, glory, and honor for what he has done. And spread the good news into all of the earth. Let everybody know that God is and God is the one that will come and redeem us. And he has blessed us and he'll bring us. And he'll break those chains that has us bound if we would only put our trust in him. Tell that good news to somebody. Somebody is waiting. I, I always tell you all this. I'm excited about Christmas time when we come sing the song, Go Tell It on the Mountain. Tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Tell the world that Jesus Christ is Lord. But my question is, 
Why do we wait till Christmas time to sing that song? It's our duty to go tell it on the mountain each and every day, not just at Christmas, every day, every opportunity that you have, tell somebody about Jesus Christ, the Lord, the, 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 the one who came to free Israel and Judah, but he came also to free you and I, to redeem us from our sin. We all sin and come short of the glory of God. No, not one. Everyone has been uh, caught in the power and the penalty of sin that came through Adam. But the second Adam came to break that bond, break that bondage, break that yoke that had us so bound. God bless you today. Our prayer today is, Lord, we thank you for Israel's, Isaiah's prophecies and, and the way that your son Jesus fulfilled them. Make us the people who call captives to be uh, to freedom in Jesus Christ, in whose faith uh, in his care is unwavering. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Our thought for the day is the day of salvation is now. Today we have an opportunity to let somebody know about Jesus Christ. And, and know something else? The greatest way of, of evangelizing the world is to show love. Have the love of God in your heart. Show the love of Christ that men, women, boys, and girls might see Christ's love in you that they too might come running saying, what shall I do to be saved? God bless you all. Bless your name. We praise your name. We, we, we may and may not be back on next Friday evening and next Sunday. I'm not sure, but Sunday morning may be Friday evening. We'll be traveling down to Carolina to pick my wife. My wife will be flying back from Missouri on Friday, we're picking her up at the airport in Greensboro, and we're going to take us two or three days uh, to, to spend some time together. Had three or four weeks been separated, taking care of my, my son and his wife and grandson out in Missouri. But we do thank God for your faithfulness joining us, and we ask that you just continue to give God all praise, glory, and honor. So we ask that you continue to pray for the sick, the study, and the bereaved. Pray for the lost. And, and not only pray for them, let them know about Jesus Christ, the, the, the redeemer of Israel, the redeemer of all mankind. We need him in our lives. God bless you. Let us bow. Father God, we do thank you, Lord. We praise your name. We glorify your name. We give your name all the praise and glory for all that you have done. We ask that you would just now continue to bless our ministry. Bless the word that go out that it shall not return for. Let the word rest in some soul that they might come running and saying, what shall I do to be saved? Lord, go with us this day. Continue to help us to hold on and continue to help us to put my, our trust in you. This is our prayer in Christ Jesus' name. Let everybody say amen. Amen and amen. We'll see you again on our next return, whether it be on this Friday or this coming Sunday. But if not, we'll see you when we return again. God bless you. May heaven ever smile upon you.